Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Bell, host of KCTS 9's Food for Thought series and the James Beard Award nominated podcast, Your Last Meal. And I'm a longtime journalist at Cairo Radio. And I am so excited to be here tonight for The Great Northwest Recipe. We are celebrating the first season of PBS's The Great American Recipe and the announcement of season two, which is coming in summer 2023. Tonight, you're going to hear from local community members about their most meaningful recipes and the stories behind them. This is our first in-person Food for Thought event. We have a live studio audience. Let the people at home hear you. And I'm really sorry for everyone at home because we're going to be eating tonight. Everyone in this room is going to be eating all of the dishes that we're talking about today. So if you're at home, do not let a snack possibility pass you by. Get your snacks out now. Fill the bathtub with Cheetos. Nobody can see you lower yourself in slowly and enjoy the show. So before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors, True Cup Roasting Company and Fremont Brewing. Let's get a round of applause for our sponsors. And we'd like to thank all of our members and donors who are joining us today, both in person and online. And after the event, anybody who's here in person, stick around. We're going to hang out, talk about the show, have a drink. I want to hear about your stories, your food stories as well, so you don't have to run away after the show. Our guests tonight are an eclectic mix of personalities with a tie to the Pacific Northwest. On our left here is Nikki Tomeno Aleman. She was a contestant on the first season of The Great American Recipe. She is a Washington native who now lives in Idaho. Uh, and Nikki created Easy Peasy Kitchen. She offers meal plans, shopping lists, and cooking guidance to busy families and a meal prep delivery service. Over here on my far right is Cooking 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 that's how you pronounce it. Cookie Couture is the reigning Miss Gay Seattle, the 57th queen to hold the title. She is the creator and main DJ of Queen for Queen, Pony's monthly drag show, host of the Skylarks, lost my place, monthly all-ages West Seattle drag show, West End Girls, and a cast member of Elysian Capitol Hill's monthly Drag Me to Brunch. She also hosts the podcast Queen for Queen, number four, if you're going to look for it on your, you know, your Apple podcast, spotlighting Seattle's drag community and history. And to my direct left here, Darnisha Weary is the co-owner of Black Coffee Northwest in Shoreline and the CEO of Let's Do Work Consulting Group. She is a Seattle native with over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, and her mission has always been to serve others, build community, and make a positive impact by challenging racism. Her nonprofit is called Grounded. It provides internship, internships, youth leadership development, and mental health counseling to local youth. And she she also co-hosts co a podcast because it is the law in this country to have a podcast. Hers is called Grounded Conversations. If you don't have a podcast, we will be arresting you before you leave tonight. On my right is Molly Moon, the owner of Molly Moon's Ice Cream. When she opened her first scoop shop in Seattle in 2008, she was the there was only one other place in town that was making homemade ice cream. I interviewed her back then, so it's really fun to chat again. Molly's philosophy is that a shared love of ice cream brings people together for the common goal of pure happiness. She is a devotee of sustainability and a tireless advocate for workers' rights. She worked on legislation to give Washington workers paid sick leave, paid family leave. She worked on $15 minimum wage. And a few years ago, Molly Moons went pay transparent with the intention of closing the gender pay gap. These people are amazing. I am so happy to have them all here with us tonight. Not only food lovers, but people who are so important in our community, every single one of them. I actually teared up when I was writing these bios a couple nights ago. So thank you all for being here tonight. So without further ado, let's give them one more round of applause and we'll get started. So the way the night's going to go, we're going to talk about, I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions. Everybody can chime in. And then we're going to go one by one and talk about their family recipes. And as we talk about them, you will be served that dish. Um, all right. So my podcast, Your Last Meal, what I do is I interview celebrities about their last meals. And then I bring on other people to talk about the science, the history, and the culture. And 
you know, people always like, what celebrity did you have on? And I get to do all my name dropping. Uh, but I actually think that real people are more interesting when you're talking about food because it's so relatable. Everybody has their food stories, you know, whether your parents were bad cooks or good cooks, the stories are good. And I'm a food voyeur. I want to know what all my friends had for dinner last night. I want to look in everyone's fridge. Uh, and so that is my first question. I used to do a, a column for The Stranger where I would look in people's fridges, notable Seattleites. So let's talk about your current fridges. If you can like pull up that image right now. What is something in your fridge that you would like push to the front if somebody was looking? And what is something that you're like, how can I throw this away before she comes over? We'll start with you, Cookie. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm definitely like a condiment uh, sauce kind of gal. Okay, so my entire refrigerator is full of like three different kinds of ketchups. We got two different kinds of tartar. We have like five different kinds of ranch. Okay, so so I would probably be pushing most of that to the side if you were to come over. Um, and I mean, I need to go grocery shopping, so there's really nothing else in there. There's but nothing that, but... in there. You can make a nice condiment soup for winter. Mm hmm. <laughs> Molly, what about you? Uh, this may not surprise you, but there is so much milk mm -hmm. in my refrigerator. Mm -hmm. I have two girls. We're a big milk drinking family. Um, so I we get a Smith Brothers milk box, and it barely fits in the fridge on Monday mornings, our delivery day. Um, yogurt, cheeses, mm -hmm. some homemade muffins that I pack my kids every day in their lunches. Um, honey crisp apples always mm -hmm. a, a refrigerator door that is way too full of condiments you guys also. should hang out lots, a of, lots yeah. of pickles well what are you embarrassed of what's in there that you're like ooh? probably just like all of last week's meals that are the tiny amount in the in the mm -hmm. in the tupperware yeah. that needs to be gone through the ones that you just hope will go bad so you can throw it away and not feel as guilty yeah yeah darnisha what about you Let's see. So my son is home now visiting from college. Um, and so I just made him clean out the refrigerator this morning. So <laughs> it's clean. <laughs> um, what's in there? I would say we love like salami, like meat and cheeses types of things. And so we'll go buy tons of those. Those are probably all over my, and I love snacks. I'm a snacking kind of girl. So I love snacks. The thing that I would hide is probably all the bottles of wine. <laughs> you can put one in each boot yes. in your closet. We got lots of bottles of wine, especially during 2020. Like we, I feel like we just, you know, there's <laughs> lots of wine. Uh, but yeah, we love like meat and cheese. I will eat that like all night and just like go in the fridge and like take some out, eat it. So the green room back there was made yes, for you. Yes, it, was, it like was. A salami fountain. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. And the little bags of chips. Yeah. And Nikki, what about you? So our fridge is always just stocked packed. I have two boys, um, but I would say we are condiment people too. And on the show, um, Brian Lee, BT Lee's has a sauce line. And so he sent those to us and those are my favorite things in the world. So that's what I would like push to the front and make you see and try every single one because they're amazing. And then probably a lot like what you said, the little leftover stuff, I would probably hide in there but um we have chickens so i just put it all in a bowl and then oh feed. so the chickens eat your leftovers they do that is convenient <laughs> i know nice so that part's good but um just probably i wouldn't want you to see like the unorganized mess that a fridge can turn into at mm -hmm. times i'd be like just you'd open it and i'd quickly shut it <laughs> yeah <laughs> You may have seen this story. It's kind of been everywhere in the news over the past couple of weeks. There is a woman who is cooking recipes that have been engraved into gravestones. Uh, she's made it this project. She was in librarian school and she had her internship at a cemetery and people have been sending her. I mean, I think she's only found 13. I would have thought there was much more. Uh, the first one she made was a spritz cookie and there was no actual instructions, just the ingredients because the family didn't want to give the whole thing away. But the entire gravestone, it's not like she was a mother, she was a daughter. It was like, she liked these cookies. Um, so I'm curious if there was a recipe that you would put, if you had to put a recipe on your gravestone, what would you want to represent you till the end of time? I mean, I come from a long line of people who are challenged in the kitchen. Um, look at me, okay. But, um, <laughs> And I made some waves in the Seattle drag community recently because somebody posted on Instagram or whatever. They were like, what's everybody's favorite midnight snack or whatever? And 
Um, mine is pretty disgusting, and I'm and I'm going to share it with you today. So yes. on my gravestone, I think that what I would have to put, and this pushes the narrative of me being uh, a condiment queen, uh, like I was just saying, but one of my favorite things to eat, you guys, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed, is I like to take a little bowl and uh, put ketchup in it and take a saltine cracker and dip it in the ketchup and eat it. With gloves on, though. Yeah, so, so I would I would have to say that. That's my legacy, crackers and ketchup. Thank you. Do you have a cracker of choice? I mean, uh, just just saltines. Just oh, yeah, I tried saltines it once. Right. I tried yeah, it saltines. once with unsalted tops, honey. It did not hit the same. Okay, so you got to have saltines. What about you? This was a hard question. Thank you for sending some questions in advance, Rachel. Um, but if I had a recipe on a gravestone, it would have to be my hot fudge. Not only is it great on ice cream, but when I was developing the recipe for my book many years ago. I had like um, liter jars of it in the fridge, a lot of them, and I couldn't figure out, I, I couldn't um, just toss it out, it, you know, and it was good. And they were all versions of what became my hot fudge recipe. And so I learned to put hot fudge on bananas, toast, French toast. I started putting hot fudge on saltine crackers with <laughs> microwaved marshmallows for my own little s'more because I don't like graham crackers. I really, hot fudge, I have learned, goes well on anything. Mm -hmm. I want to chime in because I relate to your late you. night meal, which is also a condiment, which my listeners actually know this about me. I love sour cream. I eat it with a spoon and I don't understand why people think it's so gross because it's like yogurt, but more tart. And I think on my gravestone, it was it's similar to yours because I like to drip um, tapatio onto the spoon and just eat it by the spoonful. But like, it's only good alone with the light of the fridge casting this <laughs> terribly unflattering glow on your face. And yeah, you can't eat that with people. It's a, And that's gonna be on my gravestone, yeah. I would have to say baked macaroni and cheese. That's my favorite. It's something, I didn't grow up as well with uh, cooks you know we kind of ate wherever we ate <laughs> um after our mom was home from work you know just kind of made dinner but baked macaroni and cheese is my favorite and you can eat it all day every day cold like i love actually going in the fridge late at night and just cutting a piece out cold and not even putting it in a plate and just like eating it like that's i feel like that's what how it's supposed to be eaten. just eaten. like in your face yeah just in my hand just like eat it yeah that's my favorite <laughs> i would definitely put that on my grave soon <laughs> nikki okay so Mine's a little more traditional, I guess. Um, so I'm from a, a Italian family, and every year we do the Feast of the Seven Fishes. And it's um, a cultural, uh, generational thing, and it's been handed down. And so one of the dishes we make is bacala. It's a salted cod stew. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. People um, come over. We have this feast, and um, we invite all of our friends and neighbors. And so there'd be like 20 people here and um, people started to come with Tupperware because they wanted this dish to go home with. And so um, I would put the bacala on my, and I too would eat it cold, like the next day, it was just good. And then you had this dish and then that's what you were eating the whole next week as well. <laughs> so, yeah. And then you'd get the honor of being the only grave in America that has salt cod yeah. printed onto it, probably. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, we've hinted a little bit about families and, you know, cooking or not cooking, but I want to get a little deeper because when we get to the recipes, these are all family recipes. So um, we were talking a little in the green room. Cookie, talk about what cooking and food was like in your house. Who cooked? What were they making? Um, I definitely grew up in a household where we did not sit at the dinner table. We were perched around our TV trays. Oh, lucky. That was and, my dream. And we would watch Jeopardy pretty much every single night. That is, That was my adolescence uh, experience. Uh, my, my mom would cook sometimes. She had like three uh, different things that she would cook. She would... Uh, bake a chicken and it was like the most like white lady chicken you've ever had no seasoning nothing just right there in the oven um, She would make grilled cheese sandwiches and macaroni and cheese and we would sit around the TV and we would watch Jeopardy and I love it. I loved it 
That's What's right. your macaroni and cheese from a box? Oh, honey, craft. Yeah. yeah. 100%. It's 100%. The best one. I'm I'm sure I'm sure that your baked macaroni and cheese is way better. But yeah, from a box. It's all nostalgia though. Sometimes craft is exactly what you want and you can't have a nice baked mac and cheese when you need the craft. Well, even when I make macaroni and cheese now, it just reminds me of when my parents would make it for me, yeah. you know, it's like comfort food yeah. from a box. Mm -hmm. And you can't not eat the whole box. Yeah. That's, that's my strategy. Yeah. What was your family like with food and cooking? Uh, my mom cooked seven nights a week. Uh, we sat around the dinner table seven nights a week, basically. Um, I set the table, my sister and I cleaned up the table afterward. It was pretty, um, predictable. My mom was a great cook, but she worked a lot too and was kind of trying to do it all. Um, but she made wonderful recipes. Some of my favorites were, um, she made a pasta with, uh, white wine, scallions, chicken, and bacon. That was just like my favorite comfort food pasta dish that I would like ask for on my birthday. Um, my favorite food to this day is steamed artichokes. And that would be like a treat that we would have. And I love that like a treat was a vegetable, but Same dipped in a lot too. of mayonnaise. Yeah. Um, we all shared one artichoke. It sounds like some like we all would share one artichoke. Oh, yeah. Those were the I feel days. like I remember our family getting like progressively more financially stable as we went from maybe sharing an artichoke or two yeah. to everybody got their own. Because when you get down to the heart, which is like you're just getting through those leaves, you can get to the heart and then you get a quarter of the heart. I mean, you would savor that little tiny piece. Yeah. Yeah. And then my dad cooked to a little bit and he's here tonight with us. Woo, Papa Moon. Um, and his famous or my favorite recipe that he would, it was like if it was dad's night to cook, it was basically like breakfast for dinner or bacon fried rice. Mm. And his bacon fried rice is so good. I just made it last week. It's delicious, and um, those were those are my my memories of of food growing up. We maybe I feel like we went out to a restaurant once or twice a year, yeah. really, or take out. Yeah. My mom just put dinner on the table every night, and I feel so lucky for that. You got to keep the sizzler in business. You got to go <laughs> once a year. You mentioned a little bit, but if you want to talk a little bit more, what, who was cooking at home? So we were, my mom was working, and so it was more of like whatever we set out in the morning in the in the kitchen to unza <laughs> was what we were having for dinner. But we were more of just whatever she felt like cooking and is what we ate. And we did, we gathered around, we'd come home after school, and just kind of gather and, and be ready to eat something. Because, you know, after school is when we're starving. Um, and so we would just eat. Uh, my favorite meals, though, I would recall our breakfast for dinner. Um, that was my favorite. I love like French toast at night and bacon and eggs. It was like nice and warm and filling and it just felt like warm and nice. And so I would say that was uh, my favorite meal. I mean, my family now have two adult children and, and we have started like new traditions in our family and making sure that our kids come home and have a meal around the, the table. And so I love the fact that we get to start new food traditions with our family that will hopefully be passed on. So we have definitely made up some new, well, I would say I have made up <laughs> some fun new recipes that hopefully will be passed down uh, to the kids. We have some hit or misses, but you know, I'm having a great time like creating new um, traditions around food with my family. Um, but my my growing up, I would say my favorite was always breakfast um, for dinner was my absolute favorite thing to ever have. I think there must be something about when you're a kid, there's so much structure and there's so many rules and it's like, that's just really flipping the script. Like we're going to have what's from the morning and the night. Totally. Like that's Kids a wild love childhood. Pajama day at school. Yes, they do. Right. They like backwards day and breakfast for dinner. Those yes. are like the most exciting things. Totally. <laughs> and you mentioned a little bit as well. But yeah, tell us more about who was cooking and what was eating like at home. Right. So um, I my parents were divorced. And so my mom did the best she could. But she was a terrible cook. Terrible. Um, her idea of curry was um, cream of mushroom soup with curry powder in it. 
<laughs> so it's not great. Sorry, but, Southeast um, Asia. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she did a good job of taking me to Asian restaurants to give me like better flavor. But my my parents, uh, my other, I, I don't say step and stuff like that, but my other parents are here, my dad and my, my mom here. And so uh, my mom has been a flight attendant for 50 years. And so she flew to Narita and to Shanghai. And so kids would come over and my house was the one where like you couldn't read any of the condiments. Nothing was in English, right? It's all, um, you know, people, what's this funny letters? And, uh, or, you know, my dad was cooking. So they, they definitely shared. And um, so a lot of Italian uh, spaghetti, meatballs. We always, always, always had marinara going. And then um, they are the king and queens of, they always cooked the hash. So it was bringing everything out of the kitchen, making sure that everything got used and eaten. Um, so like Monday, you might have um, started out with like pieces of chicken that went in like whole baked potatoes. And by the end, it was like a soup, right? Like by Friday, you're just eating it all in a soup. But um, they they definitely cooked at home and it was just always amazing. And then you talked about like never eating out. We ate out one time every Thursday, we either had pizza or we went to the same Chinese restaurant and I would get mushu pork. And that was my, that was my thing. So yeah. Okay. One little quick speed round across the board until we get to the next segment. If somebody was coming to Seattle or Boise, you can choose, uh, where would you tell them to go? What's your favorite place? This is so easy for me to answer. I would take them to get a Dick's hamburger immediately. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Seattle classic. Spinasse. Spinasse. So do you get my favorite thing? What's your favorite thing? The ragu. Oh, the, okay. We have like a dueling. I like the uh, sage butter. Oh, that's delicious too. too. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, communion. communion. Yes. If you could get if a reservation. Get yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So when my husband and I come into town, because we're I'm from born and raised Seattle, um, we go to Etta's mm -hmm. um, right down Tom off Douglas Pike Place. Yeah. Yeah. It. Well, I'll tell you where I tell people to go because it's going to spin right into the first course for you today. Uh, when people come to town, I tell them to go to Aviv in Capitol Hill for hummus uh, because it is really the only, please let me just do this all night, hummus that tastes like it does in Israel. And I'd never been able to find that in Seattle and actually not really anywhere else in the country, uh, which leads me into my story and your first course today. So, there are two ways to say it, and I think they're two different dishes. There is hummus, and then there is hummus. And we're gonna do a little practice here, so say it after me, hummus. Hummus. Get into the guttural part of your throat. Yeah, we have napkins for you at the table for a reason. So when I was growing up in the 80s, there was no hummus. There was no Trader Joe's. You know, you wouldn't go to Safeway and find hummus. You wouldn't go to like your neighborhood pub and have hummus and carrot sticks next to a hamburger. Like we ate hummus at home because I grew up with a dad who grew up in Israel. Uh, and I traveled to Israel with my family several times. And there was a certain taste and a certain texture of what that was to me. So when hummus came on the scene, and I tried it for the first time at a party. I was like, oh, what is it? Why did they do this to the people? My people. It is so different. It tastes so different. And I, I don't care for it. I, it's not that it's bad. It's just different. It's, you know, if you'd had a version your whole life, it's just a different dish. So I started trying to make it myself. And there's very few ingredients in this dish, but it never turned out right. So it's just garbanzo beans tahini, a little garlic, a little lemon, um, and maybe some water. You do not put olive oil in the blender. You don't do it. We'll get to that later though. And every time I made it, it just didn't taste right. And I tried everything. Smitten Kitchen had a recipe that you took off the little peel from every garbanzo bean. I did that. People swear by that. I was desperate. I, you know, soaked them and put baking soda or powder. I can't remember now. And, you know, pressure cooked them. And no matter what, it didn't turn out right. And when you look up recipes online, it says, you know, two tablespoons of tahini. 
that's wrong. So two things happened that finally got me to the right place. Number one, there was this event at the JCC in Mercer Island. And afterwards, there was food. Uh, and part of the nosh was hummus and pita. And I took one bite and it was like, boing, like my eyes opened up. I'm like, oh, who made this? And I walked around, do you know who made this? Do you know who made this? And they put me in touch with the caterer. It was this old retired Israeli guy who wasn't a caterer except for the, the JCC. It's the only thing he did. I called him. I asked if I could go to his house in traditional old Israeli man style. He just kept, I don't know what the big deal. What do you, it's just, whom, you know, I'm not going to try to do his accent. Uh, so I went over and he showed me and his garbanzo beans came out of this huge can from restaurant depot. And so that was like, number one, I don't need to peel another chickpea. I don't need to soak another chickpea. And then I had uh, the chef owner from Aviv on my podcast and I was asking him and he wouldn't give me the brand, but the secret is Israeli tahini, which you cannot get in this country. They that don't tahini sell at it. Aviv is incredible. It's so good. Yes. And for those who don't know, all tahini is, is sesame seeds. It is one ingredient. It's a sesame paste, but it depends on so much where the sesame seeds were grown. And Israeli tahini comes from a particular area in Ethiopia where the sesame seeds are supposed to be best. It depends on how long you roast it for. You know, it could be bitter. Um, so it's like I wine or coffee, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the terroir of the tahina. So I started ordering it online from Israel. I don't usually do persnickety things like this, but this is what I do now. I have to order it and I order 10 at a time to like cut down on the shipping. And the brand is Harbracha if you want to order it. Um, and you don't put two tablespoons of tahini. You put glug, 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 glug. Like that's the main thing. You keep pouring it. Um, and I'll just tell you the recipe really fast because it's so easy. The other key is having a Vitamix, which unfortunately is an expensive piece of equipment. But you want the hummus to be like frosted. You don't want it runny. You don't want it to be like, I don't, you want it ethereally smooth and like frosting. So you make this tahini sauce first with a little garlic, not too much, uh, a little lemon and the tahini. And you add a lot of cold water because it will seize up. And when that gets to the texture you like, then you pour in your can of garbanzo beans from anywhere and you blend that in again, water, water, water until it's a good texture. And then you pour a lot of very good olive oil on top on the plate and salt, 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 salt. So I'm sure 100% that what you're going to eat right now is going to be delicious. But it was hard for me to give this recipe because I don't really have one. I poor taste, poor taste, poor taste. So I'm interested to taste it to see like how I did when I wrote it down. So please enjoy. And if you're out and about in Seattle, try Aviv. It's the real thing. And their pita is so chewy and delicious. And but amazing. they're closed from three to five every day. Yeah, that too. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, and I'm such a diva that I made KCTS nine order the Harbracha from Israel. <laughs> so you're eating the real Israeli tahina right now. Um, so yeah, please enjoy. The next recipe we're going to talk about, because we're kind of going in order. This is like your hors d'oeuvre, and then we'll have your main course. And lucky, oh, we'll have breakfast for dinner, and then we'll have two desserts. Um, but Nikki, tell us about your brown sugar molasses salmon. Okay, so this came about in a really funny way, in my opinion. Um, I grew up Pacific Northwest. Uh, one of my dad's uh, big clients is Ivers. You all know who Ivers is. And so go downstairs and we'd have this freezer and it was stacked with salmon, right? So we always had salmon at home. It was just amazing. We did cedar planks, smoked it, all the different ways that you could possibly have salmon. That's I grew up with it and it was just great. Um, so even for the seven fish dinner, you go down to Pike place and we have, um, uh, pure foods and, and that's where you get all of our fish. So I moved to Boise, Idaho and, uh, <laughs> their water source, <laughs> it's landlocked. And so it was really hard for me to get used to that. And my husband was like, but there's a river and, um, it's just not the same. So, uh, before we got married, we were having our uh, basically first date. He knew that I love seafood, the salmon, grew up with that. So he was going to cook for me that night at his house and invited me over. And I, you know, I peek in and I'm like, oh, huh, that's interesting. 
um, okay, there's a cedar plank. That's that's great. Okay, good. And I was snobby back then, back then. And um, and just so like just back then. So he puts out, um, you know, the piece of salmon. It's gorgeous. And um, next thing I know, he starts smothering it in this brown sugar and putting it all over the top. And I'm like... What is he doing? I just imagine Cookie running out of nowhere and like squeezing ketchup all over and being like, (laughs) bye, and then running back in the closet. I would. I would. (laughs) I was like, he's killing the salmon. He is literally killing the salmon. And then he has this jar and he pops off the top and it rolls around and it's molasses. And I absolutely despise gingerbread. I hate gingerbread. The flavor, I don't like the cookies. And so I'm like, this is a deal breaker. (laughs) We're not getting married. This is the last date, whatever. So being the snob that I was, I went into the next room and I called my parents. He's killing the salmon. It's going to be awful. What do I do? And they were like, you eat it and you appreciate it and you be nice. And I was like, okay. So you went in there and sure enough, you guys, it was absolutely amazing. It was so delicious. And so uh, we met married in a year, 18 years later, uh, we're still going strong and we have this dish every first date anniversary. And we've spruced it up over time since then and made it a little bit better. But this this was um, his surefire way to my heart. And uh, he just keeps winning me over and over every year. So, yes. Nobody on at my homo story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I just chime in yeah. about the Northwestern salmon snob so i too i've only been here 20 21 years but i also feel i am now a bona fide salmon snob and i went to a friend's house a few years ago and also was mortified when she was smothering the tops of salmon fillets with mayonnaise and parmesan say that yeah and i was like (laughs) what is she doing with the mayonnaise and it is amazing it's so it's so good I, don't know. I think it is a, ways to make a salmon. It's a lesson of what your parents said, because I think any of us who I can tell some of us are alphas in the kitchen. And I've been guilty of, you know, telling a partner, what are you doing? Why are you doing? And it always turns out good. And like just trusting the other person and letting them make their food and being appreciative. And if it isn't the best, that it's not the worst thing that ever happened. I'm saying this out loud to tell myself this. <laughs> so I listen to myself for the future. OK, Cookie, tell us about Company for breakfast. I'm so excited to tell you about company for breakfast. Okay, so as I've established, I did not come from a long line of uh, culinary masters. Uh, I also uh, came from a group of people who love to procrastinate. Okay, and that's kind of where company for breakfast came from. So um, I'm from Bellingham, Washington. Any any Bellinghamers in the house? Um, and I have a huge family. And um, as happens sometimes when people have big families is we used to rotate whose house we would celebrate at for Christmas and stuff like that. And whenever it was my mom's turn, she would make this dish called company for breakfast. And um, it's my understanding that it's kind of been passed down. My grandma, I remember her making it when I was younger. And basically uh, what it is, is it's like a breakfast casserole. Okay. So like oh my gosh, the whole family's coming over tomorrow. It's Christmas day. I don't have time to go to the grocery store. What am I going to do? Well, you're going to make company for breakfast, which means you're going to clean out your entire refrigerator. You're going to grab eggs, you're going to grab vegetables, meats, whatever you can find. And honey, who cares if it all cooks at different temperatures, okay? (laughs) You're going to put it right in a baking pan. You're going to like whisk it all up. You're going to set the timer and then ding, it's done right in time for company for breakfast. So like, uh, it was actually really funny because when I called my mom, I was like, mom, I'm, mom, I'm going to be on this show and, uh, and we're cooking and I need the recipe for company for breakfast. And she just like t- kind of froze a little bit because I don't think that she's used to having to write it down. You know, she just like goes through and does her thing. So I could fully hear her like opening the refrigerator door and like, the, oh, you want to put in this many eggs and hold on this many spices and 
And yeah, that's company for breakfast. I hope that uh, I hope that you all enjoy it. My mom's watching, so if you're eating it and you like it, you got to make some noise later. Okay. Do some like. Mm. So why is it called company for breakfast instead of breakfast for company? I could not even tell you it's where like having company over for breakfast. Oh, okay, okay. Company yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, duh. Okay. <laughs> she should. She should really trademark it actually and get a little TM to put after the name. I think, but. But yeah, and you know what? It's not always just for breakfast. Maybe it's company for dinner. Maybe it's company for lunch. Okay, just clean out that fridge and see what happens. So what are some things that have ended up in there over the years? Oh my gosh, an assortment of peppers, uh, spices that I don't think uh, belong anywhere near a breakfast dish, uh, all different kinds of meats. Um, American cheese. She used to throw so much American cheese in there that... Um, I don't know when the last time anybody's been to 7-Eleven is, but you know the nacho machine where the cheese, just a nice glaze of that right over the top. I'm sure that what you're eating is uh, way more delectable, but Formed we've seen nice many, ma that's the thing about company for breakfast. It's always going to be different. You never know what you're going to get. It's part of the surprise. Have you made it for company before as an adult? I have not yet, but I think that I am ready to finally step up and do it this holiday season. So have you not, why have you not made it? Honestly, I think that every time that I have it, it's for the holidays. So it's just like mom's in the kitchen doing it. We don't ask questions when she's in there doing her company for breakfast thing. You know, grandma can go in and support. But, you know, eventually I'm sure I'll be brought in and they'll lift the veil and I'll uh, see what exactly goes on in there. The veil of melted American cheese. <laughs> yeah. Yum. Yeah. Mm. That's where all their secrets are. Lift it up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is everyone eating now? What course are we on? Are you about to have company for breakfast? Okay. Oh, good. Mom, did you hear that? It's still, she's watching at home. Mom, it's good. <laughs> I want to know what's in there. Can, can people yell out? What are you, what are you tasting in there? How did, I want to, how did you tell them what to do? Like, were you like, well, go into your own fridge, bring that out. I, I literally called my mom and I was like, mom, I'm going to be on this thing. I need the recipe. And then she kind of just freestyled it. So I'm a little bit curious about what's in there too. So you'll have to let but me know. But when KCT yeah. asked it, how did you tell them? Um, I, d I wrote it in an email, sent it off. What his Send mom? Send a carrier pigeon. What her mom Whatever said. His mom yeah, said. yeah, yeah. Okay. Enjoy. Okay. On oh, to... you like it? Good. I love it. It's good. It smells good. Oh, yeah. I can't smell it. Okay, shout out what's in there. What are you tasting? Green peppers. Bacon. Is there hash browns in there? Potatoes. Cheese? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Oh, so good. Just dump the nacho cheese right on top. Can we send it back. Send it back. No, I'm kidding. A crustless Ooh, quiche. I like How that. chic. Fancy, yeah. right? So Very chic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to have two desserts, which means it's a good night. Um, two very different desserts that actually would be really tasty together. Uh, Darnisha, tell us about black coffee, coffee cake. All right. So um, my husband, I met my husband about 25 years ago. Um, the first thing that we connected on is we both were coffee lovers. Um, I'm from this area, born and raised. He's actually from Yakima. So he's from the other side of the mountains. But his family is from Louisiana. And so his mom's a southern mom. You know, she's in the kitchen cooking big portions and meals and southern food. Well, here I am. I don't know how to do any of that at all and so i remember the first thing she asked me was like can i cook and i was just like uh i could yeah. try <laughs> i could try um but the first thing again we loved is coffee so our first date was actually at a coffee shop um and it was there we actually started talking about opening our own coffee shop that was like our first on your first date that was our first date wow. like conversation Wait, what shop? Um, yeah where i were will you? not say why it was not black coffee oh, okay <laughs> so they're still around it was a large chain okay yes. yeah. so all right there. <laughs> yes, a very large chain known in Seattle. Um, so that was our first date. We actually, again, we talked about like opening a coffee shop. We loved coffee. Um, and I decided, and he loves cake. And so I was like, well, I'm going to try making a coffee cake and try to like make it, you know, like my first dish. My mother in law, of course, was judging me. I think, is that, I think every mother in law judges. Yeah. She's judging my food. And so I remember I made it for Thanksgiving and she actually liked it. I remember like putting it in foil. It wasn't like a fancy presentation, right? It was in the pan with foil over it. Like, this is what we're giving. And she loved it. 
And so I felt like, okay, like, you know, I'm winning this, I'm winning here. Um, and it's something that I just kept cooking over and over and over for our family, for our kids. My husband loves it. I've played around with the recipe. I've ruined it multiple times. So I feel like that's a part of the process too. Um, we love uh, cooking it now all the time. I, I, I'm, I would say a, a couple times a month, we actually do get in there and bake. It's something that we do together, which is really fun as well. I like to take as business owners, like slow down and like, cook together and something that we make for our friends and family still. My favorite part is at the very end, like the crust at the bottom of the pan or like the the stuff at the bottom is my, I don't know if it's crust. I don't know what it is, the crumbs, the crust, um, but that's my favorite part about it. And now that we have our own coffee company, we uh, now we make it with our own coffee. Oh, Which so you get to put your own coffee into yeah, the cake. Yeah, so that was the spin is that now we use our own coffee. And I don't know, there's something nice about it's warm, it's gooey, um, it's satisfying. And always just reminds me, and we've been married now for 25 years, 25 years, raised two kids. And it's just like the one recipe that we both love. And it was the first thing that made his mom actually like me, I think. <laughs> So um, yeah. the interesting thing about your recipe is usually some people get confused about coffee cake because there's not usually coffee in it. It's yes. cake that you eat with coffee, yes. but your coffee cake has coffee in it. Mm. So can you describe, tell us a little about the recipe. Does it have like a streusel on top? What is it like? It is. So we put our own coffee in it. So I would say the same as coffee cake where we just add coffee to okay. it. So it has a coffee flavor, <laughs> it has a coffee in, the flavor in it. And I'm not a cook still to this day, but don't tell his mom that because <laughs> she thinks I am. You can make sandwiches with it. Just I use it as the bread. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would say it was like the same recipe as coffee cake, but we just actually put coffee in it. Um, I started with the box coffee cake with a box cake and like put coffee in it. That didn't work out too well. Is that what you made for your mother-in-law? The first yeah, time? I did. Did. Don't tell the her box? though. Yeah, it was the box. Don't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> it was the box. I added coffee. I was just trying to play around with recipes, but yeah. Do you serve it at your coffee shop? We do. No, we have. Okay. We have for special occasions. Um, but I mean, I I'm not gonna cook that much coffee cake. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not gonna cook that much coffee cake every day. But for special occasions, yes, we do. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Like I love it. It's something that we do eat with coffee or with ice cream as well. Um, but it's like that one thing that's in your fridge. You just go keep going back to eat more and more and more and more. And then I the next day talk about like not eating carbs. So it's like this bad like <laughs> cycle of like, why am I making this? And I'm still gonna eat it all. Tell I'm curious a little bit about the coffee because you roast your own yes, coffee. Yes. So where do you source it from? So our coffee is proudly roasted by Fulcrum Coffee Roasting in downtown Seattle. It's sourced from um, Ethiopia, which we're really proud of. And our coffee comes right from the farmers. Make sure that the farmers get all of the revenue and profits from wow. the beans that we buy from them. Um, it's very sustainable. That was very important for me. And it's also very important with the taste of coffee, where your green bean comes from. And so it's roasted in downtown Seattle. Seattle and it's our own blend and I love it. I drink it every day. All day actually. Yes. <laughs> Your coffee is friends with my tahini. They're yes. both from Ethiopia. They're yes. neighbors. Ethiopia. Yeah. Yep. Um, really so good. if you want to smear a little hummus on your black coffee coffee cake, I think that those two friends would like to reunite. I don't know about that. Doesn't that sound like a late night <laughs> drunk thing? Know. That's like goes back to the late night open fridge That's a late night, snack yeah. conversation. That's yeah. Like after all the wine. That's after dark. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try it out and let you know. Okay. Some ketchup on it. You put some ketchup on it. Hummus <laughs> after dark. And for our second dessert tonight, of course, Molly Moon has to come with ice cream. So tell us about your German chocolate cake ice cream, which you are so lucky because she made this ice cream especially for you. So if you're a fan of her scoop shops, this has never been sold before. It's just for you in this room. Oh, that's not true. Rachel. Oops, it's not true. But that's okay. Did you sell it? Um, we do make German chocolate cake ice cream on our birthday Oof. month, which oh, okay. is May. Okay, just yeah. in May. So it's a seasonal flavor, um, and we don't make it every year, but we make it sometimes in May. So uh, German chocolate cake is um, goes back to when I was about five or six years old, my mom's grandparents uh, started taking care of me in the summers. And they had done a lot of things. I was talking in the green room earlier a little bit about my very glamorous grandma, Faye. Uh, so my grandparents, Faye and John, were small business owners, and I learned a lot about small business ownership from them. And when I was a kid, they owned a saloon in Boise, Idaho called Penn Gillies Saloon. And uh, I would go there in the summers and um, 
kind of they would get ready for the day and the bar opened at three and I would hang out in the morning and like watch Sesame Street in the bar. Um, and then their next stop was the bank and they would make the bank deposit. And then we would go to the grocery store every single day. They went to the grocery store before lunch and my grandpa, John, would grab a cart and take me and grandma would go get the actual food and we would go to the ice cream counter in the Albertsons grocery store, the very first Albertsons ever. And he would get a cone of strawberry on a wafer cone and I would get a cone of German chocolate cake on a sugar cone every day before lunch, starting at six years old. So I have eaten so much German chocolate cake ice cream in my life. I've eaten so much ice cream in my life. Um, but I just loved this combination of flavors. So it's our Molly Moon's um, melted chocolate ice cream base and then pieces of chocolate cake, a ribbon of our homemade vanilla bean caramel and um, coconut. So it's it's very, very nostalgic to me, but it's grocery store ice cream sort of elevated to the Molly Moon's quality of ingredients. And I, whenever we're going to put it on the seasonal menu in May, I'm like waiting, counting down the days and I'll go in the, in the Capitol Hill kitchen and be like, did you guys make it yet? Did you make it? Did you make it? So the version that you had growing up, was it similar in that was there chunks of cake and a ribbon? Same recipe. Like I really went back and just thought, okay, what was in that flavor and made it. But it, this is all from scratch with our sort of, you know, Molly Moon's version of everything. So I've had many ice cream makers on the podcast from your shop to Ben and Jerry's. And there's a lot of engineering that goes into putting chunks into ice cream and swirls because things need to not drop to the bottom and not be rock hard. You know, like you can't put chocolate in there and break someone's tooth. So is there a certain way that you have to make the cake so that it has a good texture in the ice cream? You do have to make a cake that is light enough, but like dense enough with either oil or butter that it's going to be, it's not going to freeze into an icy cake because sometimes like there was a time when people were putting like leftover cupcakes from their cupcake company and ice cream. And, um, it was really icy. Like you can't just take any cake. You have to make it a little more buttery or denser. Um, and yeah, the chocolate chunks that they have to have like the right melting point, but coconut it's, oil. it's, it's not hard to, to find a good, like something that's more like a brownie is going to be what you want in a chocolate cake chunk in ice cream. Do you ever make ice cream at home just for your family? Do you have like a countertop ice cream maker? Okay. So I experimented with a soft serve machine this summer at home. And, um, it was a bad idea because we were trying to use it on the hottest days in the Seattle summer and it was taking forever and it wasn't working. Um, so I haven't in a while. I think that, uh, next summer, my girls are four and nine and they are just really ready to start making their own concoctions. So I think next summer we will spend a lot of time making more ice cream. Can you share the fact, I never forgot this when I interviewed you back in 2008 when you just opened and it was so fun. I got to try every single flavor on the menu. Um, you told me a fact about how much ice cream Seattleites eat, which was surprising because, you know, it's rainy and gray here. Um, how do we rank as ice cream eaters in the country? Yeah. So I did all this market research to see if opening a, an ice cream shop in Seattle was a good idea. And I found that the top ice cream eating cities in the nation were Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and St. Louis. And what I, what I thought, and then Boston was like fourth. And what I found about all, when I thought about it, what those cities have in common is we celebrate summer right? We all have like Boston and St. Louis have snow, Portland and Seattle have the longest rainy season. And when summer comes, we are excited. And that has, has turned out to be really true for Molly Moons. We're really, really busy in the summer and it's the summer sales that carry us through the rest of the, of the year. And I think, you know, Seattle summers are the best. Oh, go ahead. So do your, okay, so um, my kids, when they go to other people's houses, like no one wants to cook for them, they're scared. Like do your, like, do your kids not 
get invited oh, to mean, other parties. Um, because do you mean they, because you're known for being a good cook? They don't want to feed your kids. Cause yeah, because okay. we own a cooking business, and you know, so oh, well, we just did mac and cheese tonight, and I'm like great you know that's great but like do they not serve purposely not serve yes ice my cream? children are ice cream snobs <laughs> and it is bad actually like we were on vacation recently and i bought a pint of another great local company's chocolate ice cream and my nine-year-old would not eat it Whoa. chocolate ice cream she's nine <laughs> but she no. even try it or she's oh just, yeah well, she okay. tried she's it she was loyal. excited about a bowl of ice cream in front of her and then she took a bite and she was like i can't eat this <laughs> she's proud of her mom <laughs> she's super proud she's also really finicky and has quite a specific palate so we were actually like tweaking with our chocolate recipe a little bit this summer and i was like i said to our director of operations i was like i'm sorry but february is gonna have to come in here and take taste this yeah well she has a young pure palate you know <laughs> That is our show for this evening. Please give a round of applause for all of our guests and everything you ate tonight. Thank you to everyone here, everyone at home. We want to thank our sponsors one more time. True Cup Roasting Company. You all have a little bag next to you, a little treat in there. And Fremont Brewing. Good night, everybody.